Hell yeah, they always said the first time is the best. It's a fucking new genre, my friend. Uh, so welcome to our Quebec radio show prescription punk rock for people. And I would be surprised that don't recognize your beautiful face. Who the hell are you? Me? <laughs> I am Roger Moret from Agnostic Front. Hell yeah, the godfather of Altcore. Uh, before getting into Agnostic Front and, and, of course, the last time you came to Quebec City, uh, I'm curious, let's get back to when you were a kid. How did you start your journey discovering music and, there's, and there was people around you that influenced you into that, that quest? Well, yeah, you know, as a kid, I have, I have a pretty um, different upbringing. I was never really brought up with, like, heavy metal or anything like that. You know, I am Latin, I'm Hispanic, so I grew up in a in a household of Latin music, Motown, back disco, that kind of stuff, because that's where, you know, my roots and my family gravitated to. But my, my father was always a rock and roller, you know, like a 50s type rock and roller. But um, I really discovered punk rock through my cousin. And my cousin was the one that started playing me like the Pistols and Ramones. And I was like, wow, this is cool. Then he took me to my first shows. Yeah, there you go. And I didn't know it was just like right there, you know, like he started taking me out to the city. And we lived at the time in Union City, which is just literally a, a 15 minute drive, nah, like five minute drive, you know, or a, 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 you could take a bus there or, or a train, you know, a path train. And we started going there, like, wow, this is a whole different world, you know? Started going to all the cool record shops and seeing all the bands. Like, you would go to the record shops, look for records, and then you'd see posted on the walls, like, all the shows coming or who wanted what for bass, for guitar, you know, what bands are looking. Because we didn't have no social media back then. You know, your social media was you got to get to that record store, and that's how you're going to find out what's going on locally. Because, you know, we had the Village Voice, but... They really advertise more of the bigger shows, like the Urban Plaza shows and stuff like that, or the um, Guild of Sleeves and stuff. But to know what was really going on in the scene, you had to go to those little record stores like Rat Cage Records and Nine Nine Records and, you know, stuff like that. And and New York is, you know, when you were a kid, did you did you felt that something was happening Carl? culturally in new york because it was it was a, a huge bomb you know you you mentioned the ramones but what happened at the cbgbs and everything around that was was just unique to new york and growing up there it must be something a smell or whatever in the street it definitely smelled <laughs> <laughs> you know what man i always describe new york new york the creativity level the artistic creativity level on all on all specs from music to art to poetry to anything you know to hip-hop you know just think about it. it was just incredible i mean it was a a place where it was a an urban you know urban wildlife you know what i mean like there were no rules there was nothing you just go you do what you want to do you you just you know every store that you go to new york city now and see it's like a boutique or some whatever it used to be like a storefront where bands rehearsed And, you know, there was just so wild. I always describe it as a, like a black and white film and like in this, you know, basically concrete jungle, there was like one colorful flower or something that was the art growing in this darkness, you know, because it was always shifty, you know, we grew amongst, you know, especially, you know, living in abandoned buildings and stuff like that, you grew amongst like all kinds of predators and, and criminals and, But for some reason, we all like lived, <laughs> you know, like um, it was unsafe. But, you know, people, if if you held your own, you were safe. You know what I mean? Like you're only a victim back then in New York if you showed weakness, you know. And um, once you show weakness, you're a victim any, anywhere and everywhere, you know. So it's like you grew fast, you grew up really fast and you grew up really hard. But the scene was always magical there. It was always like creative. I mean, there's a lot of famous artists and bands and, you know, poets. And like I tell you, all kinds of, you know, different genres from New York. They're incredible. And it's just, it came out of the, that black and white film and, 
you know, it can never re it can never rehappen. It can never be duplicated again because it's so different now. It's so gentrified. It's so like a different world. I'm sure you have your pockets in in Canada too, where like in Toronto or Quebec City or in Quebec, Montreal, for example, and all these places are getting re gentrified and all that. You're losing all that uh, creativity. It's weird. It's weird to say that you miss stuff like that. But if you look at those movies like Taxi Driver from that New York movie, that's New York. That's the New York I grew up in. And and, and it's weird because, you know, you got your prostitutes, you got all this stuff hustling, all this stuff going on. But man, it was like a, a, a freedom that you just, you can't explain. You know, there was so much freedom and so much youthfulness and so much like to to be yourself. There was nothing like controlling or, or conflicting you or nothing. But uh, that was a time and a place. And I am very grateful that I grew up in that time and that place. Yeah, you're right. It's a good description. I went two times in New York. I went in the 90s and and something like 10, 15 years later. And you're right. It, it really changed because it's such a a city that lived so fast so yeah and and yeah i think that when you grew up in an uh, uh, environment like that where it's dangerous it's the nature of human to survive so you create those bonds with people and everybody kind of help each other to survive in that jungle so it really builds something when you're young that maybe other city don't have but you're right and when there's an explosion like what had happened in New York or California or San Francisco it takes a long time for something to happen again but i i, I hope that when i see montreal we're getting back to to what was the scene in the 90s and and there's something always you know it's a wheel but you're right yeah, and, yeah don't, don't get me wrong i mean there's always something going on it's it's i'm, I'm just describing old new york the creativity the beginning the uh the birth of punk, birth of hardcore punk. You know what I mean? That's what I'm talking about. I, I think that magical time can never re rehappen again. But bands are going to come and go, and there's always going to be a band carrying a torch. And we're 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 glad we're happy to see that. I'd rather hear these bands on the radio or whatever, or see them live than a lot of other crap. You know, so I'm okay. I'm okay with all the new bands and and and, and, and you know, holding that torch. You know, and that's all great. But there's just a special thing about something that can never be recreated. Yeah, you cannot build another hardcore scene in New York like you did. It just like it happened one well, time. Well, just in the think history. about just think about like a lot of these bands back then that made those crazy impacts and made punk wild and snotty and crazy. It's just think about it. The Sex Pistols were a band today; they'd be over tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> they would be just canceled like the, the day of the tomorrow. release of the first single. Canceled. Yeah, canceled you know so it was just a different time a different place where we're being politically incorrect was correct you know yeah it it's was politically incorrect was correct it was it was fuck the system fuck the state fuck everything and fuck you that was the attitude in the beginning and it was yeah a lot of sex drugs and rock and roll but then the hardcore scene came around. It was a little bit different. It was like, yeah, fuck it all. But we want to make a little difference. You know, we want to change things. We don't we really don't need drugs. You know, we just want to be something a little bit more in a positive direction, you know. But that was a uh, time and a place, you know. And that's another thing. It's a good point. When you you start Agnostic Front, you you didn't just start a movement. You start a mentality, which is really interesting because there's few bands that you know, succeed in doing that. I think Minor Threat is a good example of Bad Brain uh, with the PMA. Uh, and it, it's such a great thing. And at that time, the scene was kind of seen as violent in, in LA and, and California. It was really dangerous. And so you inject something positive and make people understand that you can be healthy, you can not take drugs or or drink whatever, or you can't do that, but do it with your brain and do it like, you know, with intelligence. So it, it really changed and shift things. And I think that's why our chord, it's such accurate music and mentality now, because it influenced so much people and inspired people to do something positive with something negative. I totally agree with you. And and did you when you started up, you know, Agnostic Front, did you did you felt that there was a hole, that there was a need for something, um, you know, more extreme as music, but also like a change in the scene? 
Well, of course, we felt like we wanted to do our own thing. We're 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 young, the young generation. Where here we are, you know, call call it 1982 when the band started, and now it's a whole wave of younger generation people getting into a scene that started back in, you know, 74, 75, 76. And that meant those at that meant their mentality was a little bit different. Love the music, love the attitude, love it all. But we wanted something fresh and something new for ourselves, you know. And with that message of making that little bit of a difference of unity or like bringing the people together and and like, uh, you know, yeah, you know, you know, we, we can make slight changes. And I've seen it. I've seen it throughout my whole years. I mean. And, you know, and but we always maintain that people should have uh, their own their freedom and right to to think what they want and challenge people. Yeah, agnostic meaning doubt of the absolute truth. So you, you know, like you, you have to challenge. You can't just everything, somebody, anything or everything somebody tells you, accept it. You know, like challenges are good. They're good for you mentally. They're good for you health wise. I've learned so much just from you know, I, I was a young, ignorant, arrogant kid, you know. <laughs> And some of the stuff I did back then, I wouldn't, if I had a chance today, I would never do it, you know? But, um, you know, I thought I knew it all. And like every 16, 17 year old kid, 15, 16, my kids right now, they're that age, 15, 17, they know it all, you know? <laughs> and I get it, you know? But um, I'm, I'm glad they're not living the, the lifestyle I have, of course. But I understand, you know? And then, but we wanted to bring something different to the table. And we always still kind of respected our roots because they were our roots and we loved them. And we had a lot of respect for all those New York punk bands, you know. And and you mentioned kids, how much your kids change your ego when, you know, they grow up. Because, you know, when you're in the scene, people see you at that figure. But when you get back to the family, my kid doesn't care about the radio show at all. You know, I'm just dad. And it, it really humble you, I think. It did. it did. It definitely humbled me. I had a child very early in my life. I was uh, 1987. My daughter was born. I was one of the few people with any, it was just like two or three of us with kids back then, you know, and it really changed my life dramatically, but not just having the kid is I had my daughter and then I got arrested and I, I did a, a, a prison and that really changed my life. The cop, the thing of Bob, like, what am I doing to my family, to my kid, I'm, you know, my daughter would cry. She wanted to be with me. Like it, it really made me look differently at life, like who I'm hurting. And cause I didn't care. I mean, prison was nothing to me. I, I you know, I, I could stand up for myself. I grew up in, a, in the streets of New York. I understand respect, give respect and, you know, and you get respect. I understand living amongst criminals. I was, <laughs> but I wasn't in a cage, you know? So that wasn't hard. What was hard was, the hurt I put on my family. So I wanted to change from that point on. And then I met my, um, you know, through year, you know, I, I tried to, when I got out of prison, try to maintain a certain uh, life that I wanted, you know, from, you know, to, I want to be there for my daughter, you know, and then I met my wife and we had kids too. And I want to be there for them. You know, I just want to be there for my kids. Kids are everything. And you know, what's really funny. We're talking about this. Yeah. You guys are familiar. With my brother's bad mad ball. Yeah. You know, Freddie. Now <laughs> he was just, When he first sang with Agnostic Front, he was seven years old, you know, and he was he was in those squats and abandoned buildings with me, you know, and, and, and he felt safer with me and all my friends and everything <laughs> than he did at home. Like we were like we were a tight tribe. We were a tribe. We behaved like a tribe, you know, and he, you fuck with anybody in our tribe, you're going to get handled by the whole tribe. And that's that was the law of the streets. You had to stick together and come together and build this unit because or else you know it's survival of the fittest you know the stronger people are going to take over so we always the, the new york hardcore scene kind of the people you know we behaved that way we behaved we were very uh protective not only our scene but our our the people involved in our scene and um uh, you know and then freddie went on to do mad ball you know but freddie was you know he's a, now i look sometimes i look back at those pictures and freddie was seven 11 when the Mad Bull 7 inch came out and I look at my kids I'm like what the hell was I thinking <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah. Show, showing your kid like the scene that was that man <laughs> yeah but honestly oh, it just it, it, it felt safe and he had a, a bunch of us supporting him and You know, there was no problem sending Freddie to the bodega to get us a 40 ounce of beer because no one's <laughs> gonna fuck with Freddie because we're right there, you know? 
but um yeah it's wild it's different you know yeah you're right and i think we're all here to connect with each other that's the main goal of life yeah uh, we don't live with money we don't live with fame we we just live with those connections we made through our life so with agnostic front you connect with so much people and with the scene you know and Freddie is a good example, taking care of your family, but bring them into your world, not try to, you know, leave them outside because it could be dangerous or whatever. It was not because you guys were bound. And like you said, you respect the rules of the streets. Uh, I had a chance to grow up. Quebec is not the same as New York. As you know, it's way less dangerous. But still, we, we, we were um, a, a tribe and everybody care of each other and i think that's what life is all about so in a way you are doing what life you know want us to do and i think that's why it it, it worked with agnostic front and why it has such importance in the history of music yeah i i agree you know i, I you know i agree with you i think uh just the life we were living was was genuine it was real it was true and people want to connect and be a part of something like that. Like if you if you go involved in in if you meet a bad, excuse me, or get involved with a scene or something, if it doesn't feel real, doesn't feel general, nobody wants to be a part of it. You know, they would come, they would meet us, they see we, how we were living and how you know close we were or what or what we were doing live, whatever. And like, wow, this is, I want to be a part of this. You know, like this is this feels like I belong. And that's how and that's what I tell people. I never tell people I got into punk rock. Oh, I got into punk rock. No, punk got into me. It just got into me. And when it got into me, it I was addicted. I just it was like, whoa, what is this? I am addicted. It's in me and I love it. You know, I'm gonna go see every band and and then I'm gonna go in the pit. And then I'm gonna start a band. It didn't matter when you start a band. You didn't have to be good. Nobody was good back then. Nobody was good. It was all participation of like, you know, I did the band, my friend did a zine, did my other friend did t-shirts, this guy did a, a flyer, and we were all like a, co a collective, not knowing we were a collective. We all supported each other. And every time our friends' bands played, we were there. And, and, and that's how it was. It was a very small scene, very, very together. And uh, and, and anybody could feel like you could do a band. I mean, I mean, I mean, listen to United Blood. It's like a controlled train wreck, you know? But... <laughs> It's it's classic in its form somehow, you know, like people love it, but it was a definitely a controlled train wreck. I'll tell you that much as I was controlling that train wreck, you know, it was crazy, you know, but nobody cared. Nobody wanted to be the greatest musician or the I didn't I, I wasn't really I wasn't going to I was never a singer. I never wanted to play in, in arenas. I always loved the, the togetherness of closest of people. It was just about me screaming for a change, saying something, saying something like we need this, we need that, you know, fuck this, fuck that, you know, that's what it was about, you know? And, and it, it, you know, a lot of people restrain, it's so sad to see people restraining their self from creating because I will not be good. Or listen to that voice. It's weird that we have those two voices, the one that say, broke that windows, and the one that say, no, 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 don't do that. But, you know, if you just try, just do it, uh, it can change your life, and it it's it's just a matter of breaking that you know that being shy or being we're all afraid to be judged i think yeah i think it also ruins bands too like if you get that mentality in your head and you want to be like that kind of rock star mentality whatever and you forget you know and then you get to a place and then you can't even get you can't go past it or you got to come back down i always tell people you're gonna meet the same people on the way up as you're on the way down it's a giant roller coaster ride and if you respect them on the, when you meet them when they're on the way up, when you come back down, they're always going to be there. They're your friends. They're your friends forever. Now, we have friends we've known forever. We travel to Europe, we travel to places. We, know, we have lifelong friends for that reason because we treat people the way we want to be treated. But if you want to be arrogant, ignorant, whatever, guess what? You're coming down at some point. And then now what are you going to do? You can't even face yourself. can't even look at yourself. And that was a whole thing. That was a secret to our longevity, too, is – again being genuine being real you know again that's everything that's a secret to to everything and it was not like we were doing anything on purpose is that's who we were when i go yeah. back and reflect on things i'm like that's what it is that's what it is it's just that you know we were just these four regular dudes loving what we're doing and still loving what we're doing and just going out doing what we want to do and we understand not everybody's going to like us not everybody's going to love us 
and everybody's got their opinion. That's what we always were about. Like, good, have your opinion. You know, as long as you're not arrogant or ignorant in front of me, that's fine. You do what you want to do, you know? Everybody's here to have a good show. Like, leave all your arrogant ignorance somewhere else. Go somewhere. You don't like the band, go, go see another band. No one told you to come, you know? Go. It's all good. There's other people that I want to play for you that, that are here that, that are enjoying the show. So just go somewhere else, you know? So that was been the way we've always been. And and I think that's why people, uh, have, you know, that start with the band are still there. It's a family exactly. thing. The song is a, is a great example of that, you know. And when I started listening to Agnostic Front, I felt that I was part of, of you know, that movement, that I could be, you know, the guy yelling at the back, but the importance of the yelling at the back is accurate. And, you know, so I think that's, that's the thing. You're always bound with the fans. And I always said to people, I find it sad when, ego and everything because you just take two minutes or five minutes with somebody take a pictures and they're gonna talk about it 30 40 I years would... later they're gonna live with that memory it's one of the greatest day of their life and like some rock star like oh, i don't meet the fans or whatever it's a choice but you know i think that uh of course the drunk guy that came to you and okay skip him <laughs> but you, gotta, you yeah. know when you, you get the those, family but... But, you know, it is what it is. And sometimes, you know, as a band member, too, sometimes you're going through things. You know, it's not easy uh, leaving your family and, you know, putting, you know, like doing what you love. And sometimes it's this life is not really a good life for marriages or any or long term relationship. It's it's a hard life. I'm not kidding you. I'm not making I'm not saying it just to say it. You know, it's a hard life. And sometimes you're, you know, you're on the road and you're lonely or, or you have some, some stuff going on home. And sometimes you do, just don't want to deal with people. And then, um, you know, you just need a little time for yourself. Sometimes people don't understand that, you know, they'll chuck it off like, Oh, he's an asshole or whatever. No, it's just sometimes, you know, I've always respected artists, you know, whatever. Um, you know, I know what it's like backstage room whatever i know i know i know what all it's like you know you need your moment you need you want to you know because yeah you love what you're doing you want to be there for everyone but just sometimes you need your yeah. space like anything else and you don't know what's going on in people's life you don't know the hardships you know and uh I, i'm being honest with you you know there's a lot of hardships and stuff that you go through and you internalize it i'm I, i've always internalized a lot of stuff i've always also i've always been a, an an introvert you know as opposed to like stigma for example you know stigma will talk to a fire hydrant or talk to a dog you know and stigma is just a different character than i am you know i've always been more private more introverted you know so um it was weird for me to even just you know, sing in a band i was always hid behind a bass and sang and it was weird when they asked me to sing because well, i'm not a singer and then it was weird to like to see this attention coming on me because that's kind of not, not where I was coming from. But then I realized how special it was for certain people. So I went with it and it's okay, but I've, I've always been more of a private person. You know, I, I feel you. I feel you. I'm, I'm, I'm super shy too. People think because you do radio or saying you like super like, yeah. like you said, like, but it's not for everybody. I'm, I'm reserved. I've got times when I go see a show, I know people are going to stop me. I'm, I'm in that mood. So I'm ready for that. But it's when I do the grocery, I don't want to speak to anybody. Fuck yourself. Don't come to me. I'm just trying to focus on what to buy. <laughs> it's funny because a lot of people that know me that don't know me through punk or hardcore and they just know me. And then they come see my show. They're like, what happened? Like, like, who is this? You know, I'm like, you know, that's that's really me. I became, you know, this is my this is what I love to do. But I'm just such a different, humble person. They're like, whoa whoa you know like i'm just very into myself like yes i'm at my wife's uh jiu-jitsu place right now and yesterday a couple of fans came by and they had skateboards and records because they know i train here so i got out and signed everything and i went back in you know like you know it's what i it's it is what it is you know but i i, I do I, I i i do like carry myself in a very humble way very private way uh, the last record is amazing. Uh, I think every record Agnostic Front has released are really, really accurate. And But the last one is very special. I'm curious, is it more hard with time to write new stuff and create new music because you have the experience, but it can be like still a struggle? 
Well, the the most, you know, first of all, we're currently writing right now. Anyway, we've got about eight songs. Um, first of all, like we have, we have to, we like the song. We have to like the songs a lot. We have to love the songs and we have to believe in them. And if we believe in them, we have to then trust that the, the people that will, will love them, enjoy them too. But there's always a critics. There's always somebody waiting for you to mess up or do something or like, want to just bring you down. But they don't, they have no one idea how hard it is to write songs. Um, you know, when you're under that microscope, unfortunately, you know, when you get to a certain level of a band, you know, here we are doing our 14th album, whatever, a, a expand career, 42 years, you know, um, it's a long career. And, and, um, and it were, you know, people always want to, some people, and most people love it, but there's always that critic, you know, and you can't never change their mind, whatever, but you know what it is, like I tell you, I'm here for the people that want to uh, accept and enjoy your show. We would just want to come to your place, have a great time. We want to play, make new friends, meet new people, and do what we love. And that's who I'm there for playing for. That's who I write songs for, you know? And, and and lyrically, we've always been socially political. You know, we don't really talk about world politics. We'll touch on it here and there, but that's a touchy subject. Everybody's got a really strong opinion about stuff. And some of it's valid. Some of it's not what you think, but all of a sudden, if you don't think that way they think, you're wrong. Who cares? I I I was I I try to work on day to day stuff that happens around me, you know, socially stuff, you know, like, you know, and it's it's I write about uh, about real stuff, my experience. It doesn't mean your experience. You know, it was interesting when I was writing my book. I uh, I was telling these stories, right, and I had Amy from Nausea, who was the mother of my child, and you know, I, I respect this mother of my child very a lot of respect. So I say, hey. I'm I'm writing this book. These are these stories. I want you to read them because it mentions it's about you too. So I don't want to say anything that would upset you. And it was the funniest thing of the whole conversation was when she says, you know, it's funny, like, you know, we have two different visions of the same story. And I never thought about that. Like, you know, it's just like, I remember what I want to remember. She remembers what she wants to remember. You know what I mean? But and it's at different. Times, at times it cross, we were both living the same story, but it's it's what you take of it. Like, you know, like I could I could I could witness something and I could write something about it, and you witness the same thing and you write something different about it, but it's the same thing. It's just how we perceive it in our minds. And it's interesting because you know, with that thought in mind, I'm like, these are my stories. Whether you know if you want to listen to my story, you can. If you don't agree with them, well, this is my experience. <laughs> It's this so is, true. And it no. doesn't take long, you know, even three months after something happened with your friends, whatever, you, you share the story and everybody has a different angle, different and, and little detail change. Yeah, they saw so, something different that you didn't see. Like, really? I'm like, wow, I didn't see. I didn't know that, you know. It's interesting, but um, it's the truth. And and how was it to get back in that history? Because it's it's cool to live the good moment and remember that, but there's always... You know the tough side of life where you get to that and it it brings a lot of emotion and sometimes it can get you really down yeah i mean writing my book was the hardest thing i've ever did uh, i started in like i tell you 1998 i think and i it was completed in 2018 2018 it took a long time and I went through many years. I went through a lot of different things. And I finally had to have a friend of mine who started editing it, help me put it all together where it made sense because I was all over the place. I deal with ADD, ADHD. <laughs> I got every I got every alphabet thing with my brain going on right now. But um, but it was my story, you know, and I want it was very important to me that I I was a part of writing my story, and that's all that mattered to me. And I wanted the person that was reading it to feel like they were there with me, you know. And um, it was very emotional for sure. And what, what was really hard about it is, um, especially when my friend started helping me, because he knew there was more to the story, but he wanted to dig. And he was opening up all these closed channels in my head that I closed for reasons, being that they were hurtful or something like that. And then when that opened, those channels opened up, so much more came alive and it's, it made it so much better. You know, because you do, you do naturally block out things, not knowingly, until somebody taps in there and gets it, 
gets to that root of whatever the thing is and you're like wow then you start going all your emotions start going like wow you know this is why i did this because of this many years ago you know like you know it's it's really wild and sometimes you know like you tap into things you know i don't know if i should have said or should have not but you know the truth is i want i want it to be out there i wrote the book for my family for my daughter for my for my daughter's my my son for their family for their you know for them to read you know i didn't write it for to please anyone <laughs> um, I really wanted to leave my legacy for them in writing, you know, and be like, Hey, this is what your dad went through from, you know, being a Cuban immigrant to America to where he is now. And just want you to know the struggles, you know, and not all it was be beautiful, not all it was great, but I want you to know that I got this far on a certain path, you know, what made the changes to get on that path. So it was really, it was really interesting and really, cool that i um dug in that deep <laughs> yeah but when it came out when it came out being an introvert when it came out i was like oh now everybody knows everything about me it was weird <laughs> you know you know like oh, yeah. oh you know it's i don't weird. know a shit about you but you know everything about me because you're in yeah. my book <laughs> but it felt so good to release some of that mm. tension and build up and like i said my sole reasoning was for my family Wow, it's really touching. It's really beautiful. And I'm sure they're going to be really happy because, you know, when we passed out and everything, that's why the question's coming and, oh, like grandparents or whatever. And now you got something that you 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 can read and say, oh, that's why I understand, you yeah. know, I'll, I'll and, and, and the struggle too. Kids don't understand that. Teenagers yeah, don't. I mean but they when they got, got kids, they understand it's rough to be parents. Yeah, they also got records and stuff to listen to. But the records is just me doing my thing. But now there's stories behind me doing my thing. Oh, you know, it's really weird because it's out there. It's out on the Internet. And sometimes sometimes my kids are, you know, and their friends, they Google me or something. And they get like, embarrassed because they know I was in prison or something. You know, but it is what it is, man. You know, it's like I say, being gentle and being real goes a long ways. And yeah. it's going to my children understand. I must say that, you know, that struggle and what you've been through create such a rad human being that change a lot of life and influence a lot of people into doing something positive. So nothing happened for nothing. So what's what's the importance? It's the result. And the result is amazing. <laughs> Thank you. You know, and like I say, you know, that, that's also because, you know, there was two there was two happy. There's two endings to that story. One is I continued doing what I was doing, continued running that path, and I may be in prison forever or end up with a toe tag and that's it, or check myself and take this path. And that's what I did. Roger, you're amazing. Seriously, it, it passed so fast. Um, we encourage people to go grab the book, of course, read it. It's a really good read. There's a lot of stuff in it. And if you want to learn everything around Roger, uh, go for it. And of course, buy the last record, the last Agnostic Front records. It's everywhere. If you don't have money, we get it. It's rough time. It's on every fucking platform. Go listen to that. Challenge yourself and go try to sing them loud. Uh, louder than Roger live. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And thank you for your time, brother. Thank you. Appreciate your time too. And then we had a, I had a good time. Good talk. Thank you. Thank you. you. And, and and of course, go. You you got every detail behind Roger if you want to take some uh, jujitsu uh, uh, lesson. And of course, uh, we're going to wait for you in Quebec City. You never forget us. That's what I love. Every two years a year without the pandemic you you always come see us yeah we we love we love canada we i mean we used to have this alliance with canada back in the days forgot what it was called they would come down all the canadian bands would come down and we would go up there and play it was this alliance it was really cool and uh, there was a couple of compilations of that alliance made too um all the good old bands on your way yeah um b all these bands all these crazy bands Anyway, um, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Roger. See you in Quebec. All right, cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye.